From the headquarters of Telesio English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I am Sweeney Gray. Venezuelan Minister of Communication Jorge Rodriguez has given a press conference presenting evidence that directly links the opposition leader Julio Borges to last Saturday's assassination attempt on President Maduro. He said that the drones were bought in Colombia and that there was collaboration from Juan Manuel Santos' government. Rodriguez also said the U.S. government, specifically the Secret Service, knew what was going to happen and approved of the attack. He also presented evidence of a taped confession of the recently captured former legislator Juan Requestions, in which he confirms that the primary operator Juan Carlos Mon Monasterios, also known as Bond, had previously said that they had acted on the command of Julio Borges. I'm Juan Carlos Requesens Martinez, ID number 18757028. Today is August 9th. A few weeks ago, I was contacted by Julio Borges, who asked me to get someone to pass from Venezuela to Colombia. It was Juan Monasterio. I contacted him by text messages. I was in San Cristobal and I sent a message to Mauricio Jimenez, who is a migration supervisor. He contacted Juan Monasterio to take him over from San Antonio to Cucuta. I was in San Cristobal. I've never met Monasterio in person. I made all the arrangements by messages. Respecting the life of this suspect, he has family. I have a family. Respecting the Constitution in regards to human rights of all Venezuelans, this is a confession of former legislator Requesens. It is up to you, media outlets, to see what you are going to do with it. And on Thursday, the Venezuelan government formally requested the extradition of several people implicated in the attempt. The request was made during a meeting between Foreign Minister Jorge Ariasa, Attorney General Tarek William Saab, and a counselor from the Colombian Embassy in Venezuela. In the meeting, the Venezuelan side asked for the extradition of opposition lawmaker Julio Borges and four others with direct involvement in the attack. And on Wednesday, the Attorney General had met with the U.S. Charge of Affairs to ask for U.S. assistance with the investigation. Today, we have met with a counselor from the Colombian Embassy, Augusto Blanco, authorized by the government to attend this meeting and also to receive detailed information. In the case of Colombia, as you all know, Training took place by this group of terrorists who made an attempt on the life of President Nicolas Maduro and practically all of the high-ranking Venezuelan military and political officials of Venezuela. In this community, located in the La Vega district of Caracas, neighbors are concerned and even weary about the possibility of another attack against the government that they elected. Given the magnitude of this, we have to be very alert. We must be more united as Venezuelans and as a community because we don't really know where they'll be attacking us from next. What happened surprised us all. We were not expecting this. The oligarchy, the opposition, doesn't rest, and they want to undermine our achievements, and they want to take over the government. In this self-managed sewing workshop, women are in power, both economically and politically. They say this was all thanks to their Comandante, and therefore, they will defend the Bolivarian Revolution in any scenario. What are we going to do? That was the first thing we thought, and many of us said, let's get together, and if we have to go to Mira Flores, we will. But they shouldn't think that they can get away with this. If they're attacking the president, we will not keep quiet. We will fight. On their part, authorities presiding over the investigation of the failed assassination plot have made progress in capturing all individuals involved. Other detentions are not discarded. Search warrants are being executed all over the country. We have more than 25 people being investigated, and the investigation continues until we get to the bottom of it. Among the criminals, six suspects have been identified in Colombia the retired colonel Osvaldo Garcia Palomo, 
Gregorio Yajuas Monje, a migration officer, Mauricio Jiménez Pinzón, Gilberto Escalona Torrealba, and opposition legislator, Julio Borges. Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza met with a representative of the Colombian Embassy in Caracas to request their extradition. First, we have complied with the activation of the internal judicial mechanisms in the country, and now the activation of the judicial and diplomatic channels internationally to request these individuals for extradition. Colombia now awaits the formal request for extradition. But meanwhile, Venezuelan foreign minister has announced a tour to denounce the attack abroad. Brazil's trade unions and social movements are participating in a day of work stoppages, false delays, and other actions. In Porto Alegre, trade unions have been out since early morning. Workers intend to bring discussion to the workplace on matters related to privatization, unemployment, and the loss of social rights. This includes the issue of unrestricted outsourcing and the labor, labor reform passed under the government of Michel Temer. Temer has also worked to weaken unions and average incomes have fallen and by 13 to 18 percent in Brazil's largest cities. The candidates for Brazil's presidential election held their first debate on Tuesday, Thursday night, but without the imprisoned former president, Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva, who has a clear lead in the polls. Social movements have condemned Lula's exclusion. The debate was dominated by the candidates of the mainstream right, all of whom are running very low in the opinion polls. They were challenged by Har Bolsonaro from the far right and Guilherme Bolos, the lone voice from the left. What we don't want is for women to continue being imprisoned or dying because they have abortions in the most precarious conditions. And above all, poor women and black women because rich women do it in decent conditions, in good clinics. Like the case of Ingriani, who we heard about in the Supreme Court hearings this week, a young woman with three children who was forced into a backstreet abortion and died. In our government, abortion will have nothing to do with the criminal code. It will be a matter of public health, respecting women's rights. And the presidential candidate, Jair Bolsonaro, repeated his promises to rule with a religious and socially conservative agenda. Bolsonaro has been running second in opinion polls behind Lula. The most important thing that we can do here is to show people that we will put Brazil first, what we will do in the name of God, always asking for his guidance to resolve problems in the best way possible, because Brazil can have another turn of the Workers' Party or the PSDB. Our correspondent in Brasilia, Andre Vieira, was watching the debate. On Thursday, the first presidential debate was held without the participation of former President Lula da Silva. Social movements are of course denouncing the political character of Lula da Silva's imprisonment and also denounce the fact that his incarceration serves to impede dialogue between Lula and the people through the debates and also through his cross-Brazil caravans that he began last year. Despite this, social movements are in standing around with their arms crossed. This Friday, a free Lula National March departs from three different cities and will march for four days until they arrive at their destination on August 14th and the 15th. They will register the candidacy of Lula da Silva and they will be denouncing all of the effects of his imprisonment and all of the effects of what's considered a sort of coup before the man can even take office. Their journey begins this Friday alongside worker mobilizations throughout all of the country for the day of Enough is Enough. Nicaragua's Foreign Minister Dennis Moncada has said that he will not accept the presence of a so-called working group created by the Organization of American States in the country. Moncada condemned the creation of the working group, saying it violates Nicaragua's sovereignty while speaking at the OAS Permanent Council meeting on Thursday. The creation of the working group was approved in a resolution on August 2nd. Mankata says that the U.S.-led countries intend to create a supranational, illegitimate and arbitrary authority to politically attack the Nicaraguan government. Costa Rica's constitutional court has ruled that the country's same-sex marriage ban is 
unconstitutional. It's therefore given the legislature 18 months to implement a new law to legalize it. Earlier this year, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights ruled that same-sex couples should have equal legal rights, which prompted the court's decision. However, some activists are not happy with the 18-month time span. 18 months is too long. What happens if my partner dies tomorrow? What happens if my partner has children? They're not registered with my surname. I wouldn't be recognized as the other mother. That's the point. More news in a minute, but first, here's a video from the team in multimedia. Welcome back. Cuba's new draft constitution is being put out for public consultation. Our correspondent in Havana, Alian Fernandez, has been looking at some of the debates it is raising. The Cuban Revolution declared its socialist character in 1961. Now it's proposing a draft constitution that doesn't include the word communism. This young history lecturer thinks that's a contradiction given that the leading force in the Cuban society and the state is the Communist Party. Socialism is not a system as such, because it doesn't have any mode of production in the Marxist sense. Rather, it is the transition to another system, which is communism. In my opinion, we should keep the aspiration of building a society radically different from capitalism. It is true that it isn't an aspiration we can achieve in the short term, but it serves as a utopia that we strive for. The draft constitution put forward explicitly recognizes the existence of private property in Cuba. Previously, various euphemisms were used to refer to the non-state sector of the economy, like self-employment. This has been possible in other countries, so why not in Cuba? And when the two systems complement each other, you can achieve improvements in the economy, which is what the country needs. This is on the way. People are being trained for this, and I think the objective should be develop a mixed economy. I think that is the right way to go. Teresa teaches linguistics and is an activist for gender and LGBT rights in Cuba. For 36 years, she's been in a relationship with Marcel Rodriguez, a radio scriptwriter, 
The proposed constitution would allow them to get married and have other legal rights. This is not a fashion. We are not trying to imitate other countries. We had a revolution here, a revolution that was for everyone, for everyone's welfare. But some this everyone was left out in the law. They weren't recognized and didn't receive what they should have received as citizens. Between August and November, ordinary Cubans will be able to make their own contributions to the draft constitution, drawn up by members of the National Assembly. The Cuban government says this process of consultation will strengthen the Cuban people's support for the revolution and that it demonstrates the country's democracy. Mexico's president-to-be, Andreas Manuel López Obrador, has made firmer, further promises to streamline his government. He says he'll do away with the traditional presidential guard. A day after he was officially declared the winner of the July election, López Obrador met with the outgoing president, Enrique Peña Nieto, to discuss the transition. He said his new security detail would be made up of unarmed lawyers, doctors and engineers. I'm going to have a team of 20 professionals, not necessarily professionals in security, but professionals, because all of them are going to have serious academic backgrounds, and there will be men and women, 10 men, 10 women. Our correspondent in Mexico City, Pablo Perez, has more on the transition of power. On Thursday around 6 p.m., Andrés Manuel López Obrador met current president Enrique Peña Nieto. Let's remember that during this week, Andrés Manuel López Obrador was just officially declared as winner of the presidential elections of July 1st, and therefore president-elect by the Electoral Tribunal. These past elections had one of the highest participation rates in Mexico's history. Now the democratic transition from priest member Peña Nieto to the coming president, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, begins now with this meeting that will take place without media presence. López Obrador also met with José Antonio Meade, former candidate of PRI, to keep reconciliation alive in a transition process which, according to experts, is one of the most peaceful ones in the country's history. Just two days after Colombian President Ivan Duque took office, there have been protests in the streets of Bogota against him. It's not clear who was protesting or why. However, they were quickly confronted by anti-riot police. Duque has pledged to improve the economy and renegotiate peace accords signed with the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. And Bolivia's cabinet is to hold its first meeting in the new government building in La Paz. On Thursday, President Eva Morales presided over indigenous ceremonies to close the old government headquarters, the Palacio Quemado, and to open the new ones, baptized the Great House of the People. The old palace will be converted into a museum. Morales said the move was a symbol of Bolivia's renewed independence. Today, August 9, we leave behind the palace of a colonial state to come here to the Great House of the People of the plurinational state of Bolivia. It's another historic milestone thanks to the struggle of the Bolivian people and thanks to the people's unity. Students and youth activists took to the streets in Chile on Thursday night to protest against new regulations on young people's labor rights. The police fired water cannons and tear gas at several hundred protesters in the capital, Santiago. The activists say the new youth statute and annex to the labor code could lead to young people being over, overly exploited since it allows for them to work up to 12 hours a day with limited rights to rest days and holidays. The government has revoked our permit, but that has never meant that we will not exercise our right to march. We are going to regardless, with or without the damn police, we will march. Antigua's Prime Minister Gaston Brown has announced plans to help Dominica retain Ross University School of Medicine. The announcement comes as Dominica grapples with the loss of the medical school post-Hurricane Maria. Last week, the school, which operated for 40 years in Dominica, announced a move to Barbados. Last evening, Prime Minister Brown said via a statement his government is willing to provide incentives that would enable Dominica to remain attractive to Ross University 
one of the incentives outlined is the lowering or elimination of transit taxes. This would assist students heading from Dominica to the UK, Canada uh, and the US. Another suggestion from Brown is that Ross and the government of Dominica enter into an agreement so that the university can remain on the island. The Dominican Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt has spoken of his intention to build sustainable housing that can withstand natural disasters. While addressing local people, he stressed the need for safe land to build on. When we build for somebody, that person will be safe in the event of a hurricane. We have to build in safe locations. And we have to build structures where you can remain in that home and see the hurricane through. And so the homes we are building now of homes that people can stay in in the event of a hurricane. And, um, and those homes will be with concrete roofs. Obviously, you will, you will see the, 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 the roofs are colored. It's just we put the zinc, the galvanized on it, more for decorative purposes. But the, 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 the roofs are concrete roofs. And the windows we chose are, are solid windows that can hold up to strong winds so you can really stay in your homes and see those hurricane, hurricanes through. Okay, so we're gonna take another short break, but join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Thanks for staying with us. Four people, including two police officers, have been shot dead in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. One person has been taken into custody. The incident is currently under investigation and the names of the victims have not been released. The shooting took place on a residential street. Locals were advised by the police to remain inside their homes with their doors locked for their own safety. And in London, janitorial staff in the Ministry of Justice and the Council of Kensington and Chelsea completed three days of strike action to demand a wage increase and other benefits. Pablo Navarati reports from London. Cleaners at the Ministry of Justice and Kensington and Chelsea Council in London walked out for three days this week in what is being heralded as the first coordinated strike by the capital's vast number of low-paid, largely migrant cleaners. Organised by the trade union United Voices of the World, the aim of the strike is to pressure these public institutions to take responsibility for the low wages paid to outsourced cleaning staff. So we are here today because we are out on strike for the London Living Wage, which uh, the cleaners in the Ministry of Justice have not been getting. They're on 7.83 per hour, which is a poverty wage that does not allow them to cost uh, their living here in this expensive city. And we also have another group of workers who work at the Kensington and Chelsea Town Hall, who are striking for, at the same time for the same things. The strikers are asking for the £10.20 an hour London living wage, which is based on the cost of living in the capital. They are also protesting the issue of sick pay, which they do not receive for the first three days of absence, and which thereafter is statutory sick pay of £18 a day. This strike is a call to demand improvement, because here in the ministry called justice, there is a lot of injustice against the cleaners, only against the cleaners, because other servers of the ministry have everything. But for us, they do not respect the payments, the payment for disease. You do not have the right to become sick. You do not have the right to claim, because they give you more work, and this has to end. After occupying the reception area of the Ministry of Justice on Wednesday, some of the cleaners and a representative of their trade union were invited to a meeting with the Vice Minister. While no clear answer has yet been given on whether the cleaners' demands will be met, they have announced they will keep on fighting. 
This historic strike has shone a light on the employment conditions of migrant workers in the heart of the British government. Pablo Navaretti, Telesur, London. And here are some of today's other stories from around the world. Farmers in the United States are still waiting for $12 billion in federal aid promised by the Trump administration as they feel the squeeze of his tariffs war. Farmers are now facing low production and the price of crops going down too, partly due to these tariffs. Trump proposed emergency relief to alleviate the pinch, which has not surfaced. Let the Catalan vote. Catalan's president, Kim Toro, called for the release of separatist politicians from jail. After last year's independence referendum in Spain, a number of people were imprisoned. There are political, political prisoners in jail in Spain, Democrats, uh, politicals that they only wanted to let the Catalan vote and are in prison now. There are uh, people in exile as well, and there are thousands and thousands of Catalans being persecuted, investigated by the Spanish police, etc. So we are, we are living in a very, let's say, critical moment critical political moment in, in Catalonia, and, and I think that this is the point. In Syria, a soldier and 16 artists have turned a tunnel used by rebels in Damascus into an exhibition of fine arts. All those involved sculpted the walls of the tunnels with creations inspired by the victories of the Syrian Arab army, which regained control of the area earlier this year. And researchers in Crimea have uncovered a riveting archaeological find not far from the Sevastopol co coastline. Sonar coastal scans have discovered a Roman trading vessel dating from the 2nd to the 3rd century AD. The ship lay 85 meters below the waves and proved to be a challenge for divers to reach. Nevertheless, divers reveled at the chance to be part of an ar archaeological mission. There have been no reports of treasures found so far. Well, we've come to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at talisiertv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Talisir English, I'm Sweeney Gray. Thank you for watching.